people get angry about this stuff, then uh, th- that is really problematic. And so I think assuming that other, I think s- the starting point is assume other people are well-intentioned and not idiots. And that's hard, you know, because it seems so stupid what they're doing. Well, you know, they think that climate change isn't the problem. But I think you, if that's the starting point of the conversation and you can actually then start to have a conversation where you really use your best listening skills and try to find some common ground. Now, I can tell you from working with developers for years, and they, they're all nervous about consultation because what they think is that there's kind of the barbarians are going to come in and ruin the business, right? <laughs> but it, it's, not, it's not necessary uh, just because you want to listen and respect people's role in the process of development, developing public policy, that you agree with things that you, you can't agree with. So you can have tough conversations. I think we need to get better at having tough conversations that are also respectful. I was interested in, the, in, the, in that shaming piece that you just <laughs> mentioned. Why can't we just get to, if we can leave enough room in the conversation that you can see yourself, and that we can move the conversation forward, it would seem that the shaming piece or the apologetic piece just gets in the way. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> it's interesting because another guy that I interviewed um, in, in the, a similar area, his name is Roger Connor. And I interviewed about him about something he calls the advocacy trap. And the, the, he says the way that works is you start to f- have strong feelings about something and you care about something. And so you start to advocate it publicly and somebody criticizes you. The, it doesn't take very long for you to move from thinking that they're wrong to being offended and then suspicious and then wondering what they're up to. And before you know it, it's like David and Goliath yeah. and, and a fight between good uh, versus evil. It's really hard to treat evil with respect. It's very hard to, to think that evil has a point. Uh, and so it's sort of natural that when you, when you run into, when you get into these conflicts, we see the other side as, uh, as wrongdoers. You know, like, why would you be sitting down to make friends with a wrongdoer? Yeah, you know, so, yeah. so it's part of human nature. Yeah. And so, so, so the, that's why, you know, and I interviewed the Dalai Lama. It, it was funny because it was, the interview was over. <clears throat> we're standing up, cameras got turned off and we're walking away and, and he pointed at my forehead with his finger and he said, uh, we like to think the Western mind is more sophisticated, but in Tibet, we go with the heart. Uh, and I think that's stronger. So yeah. maybe if we take the, the Tibetan heart and the Western mind and we bring them together, we can fix these difficult problems. What we need is more warm heartedness. I like that. I'm, you know, I'm curious in this conversation, we talked about climate change, uh, truth. What are your thoughts about fake news and deception? I was just having dinner with some friends the other night and they were talking about this. And I said, you know, they were talking about it like it was something new. Right. And I said, I said, well, let me tell you my experience with climate change. We started D smog blog in 2005 and I was horrified. I've been in the public relations business for 30 years and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, God, if I knew it was this easy to manipulate the media, I would have made so much more money. Uh, but what we quickly started to write stories about and find, and these were the people that we hired for DSmogblog, were all professional journalists uh, who were working for us, right? And uh, so researchers really good at, at digging and finding out what's going on behind the scenes. And what we found was not just fake news about climate change, fake science about climate change, fake scientists fake scientific journal, fake scientific group. A number of people have been on a search to expose this. I mean, I know that Naomi Oreski was one, but there, <laughs> there was a massive effort to discredit the science. Yeah, and this is partly ideological, as as Naomi Oreski points yeah. out, but, you know, partly as, as Richard Littlemore and I pointed out in Climate Cover-Up, this is largely financed by business interests. And so you get the American Petroleum Institute setting up certain kinds of campaigns that are designed to create doubt about climate change. Or you, uh, you, have, the, um, you have some of these uh, public relations people who come up with ideas about like junk science, heavily researched, right? So phrases that are heavily researched. 
And then they just kind of pound away at this, this idea that they're sort of ad hominem attacks on real scientists. And most of these scientists, I don't know how many scientists, you know, but they're, most of them are like introverts. They're not, they're not, you know, you see one of these guys sitting down with a political operative, they are for sure going to lose the debate, but has nothing to do with who actually has the evidence and facts on their side. Yeah. So, so what do we do? Uh, how do you, how do you wade, how do we wade our way through this, this milieu of information? Do we just reach a point where we get saturated and we turn it off? Uh, no, I think that would be a terrible mistake. I think we need to get better at the things we're not very good at right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, years ago when I first started in public relations, I had a, a mentor, an older guy who owned a bunch of PR firms in the U S and he was basically at my elbow as I was building my agency. And one of the things he used to say was, if you, if you don't tell them, someone else will, and it will be bad. And so that was something that really stuck with me, that you, whenever there's misinformation that dominates a story about something, it's it takes two to tango. It's not just the fault of the propagandist. It's, it's also the fault of the storyteller. So if, if somebody else is telling my story, that says something about my ability to tell my story. So I'm obviously vulnerable. So, so we need to get better at telling stories. And, and, and another thing that I learned in the public relations business is all good communication starts with listening. The deeper the listening, the better the communicator. The thing that makes the Dalai Lama such an incredible communicator, although he speaks broken English, is his deep, rich understanding of empathy and compassion mm-hmm. and warm heartedness. So it's the ability, the ability to tell a story of us that is, is authentic and it's rich and it's emotional. Now, the thing that's missing from climate science is the emotion. I mean, setting aside fear, which seems to like dominate the conversation, but we need to, come to the understanding uh, communicators need to come to the understanding that people need to know that we're all in this together, that there is hope for this. There are solutions to these problems, this problem. And even though it's big and it's difficult and we need to get rid of this idea that somehow facts change minds. It's not, I mean, facts are important, but facts don't change minds the way scientists think. And so I think there's a, there's a lot that can be said about being better storytellers. But one thing Peter Senge said to me was the quality of any intervention is determined by the inner quality of the intervener Mm. that you, you need to come with a open mind an open heart and kind of an open will to a conversation because there's so much BS in the world, as I was saying, you know, so much public relations in the world that people are Smart people are skeptical. Smart people are doubtful. There's mistrust, like there should be. I mean, we're not stupid. We don't want to be stupid. Uh, We don't want to just believe everything we hear. And so you need to help people sort out between uh, what should be believed and, and what shouldn't. And in this case, because of the financial interests of the oil and gas industry and many other industries, the automobile, like the whole system that's built around fossil fuels, the power there and the voice there, you really need to get good at this. And if you're not going to get good at it, you should be like, you know, on the beach or go skiing or do something else because it's just going to be really frustrating. What's your favorite story? When you look back, what do you remember most? Yeah, well, it was, (laughs) it was funny. It was, um, David Suzuki, uh, Gregor Robertson and I spent an afternoon a couple of years ago with a Zen Buddhist monk, a very famous Zen, Zen Buddhist monk named Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm. He was in Vancouver and he was out at UBC. <laughs> and um, he was talking to, to Gregor and David and, and he said, uh, you don't need to tell people they're destroying the planet. They know they're destroying the planet. You need to deal with the despair. You need to deal with how people feel. And this despairing feeling is, is, is paralyzing, he was saying. And... Um, and so I, I was listening to it and he said, he said, you need to bring meditation into your work on the environment, you know, and, and clean up the inner ecology. And I, so I thought, I thought, is he saying we should like go to the caves and just meditate? And so I said, 
I said, uh, you know, Canadians expect David Suzuki to be an activist. They expect him to speak up on behalf of the environment. You're not saying that we shouldn't be activists, are you? And he said, speak the truth, but not to punish. Speak the truth, but not to punish. And, I mean, this guy is, he's in his early 80s at this time. And I remember I was, you know, quite close to him. And he had this look when he looked at you. I felt like he was kind of like looking at my soul. You know, he just like looks right into you. And mm-hmm. and so you, it felt like I'd been punched in the solar plexus. And I, was, I remember walking off the stage. My wife was sitting in the front row and she said, you heard what he said, right? <laughs> Speak the truth, but yeah. not to punish. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, and I, and it, it took me about a week afterwards and I thought, oh my God, I've just been given a Zen koan by, yeah. <laughs> you know, the greatest living Zen master. And I have been, what a think- gift. I, an absolute yeah. gift. Yeah. I have been thinking about that ever since. And it, it's almost like an exercise that you might do at the gym, yeah. right? To try and exercise that balance between um, speaking up and and being responsible, a responsible citizen, but at the same time developing a kind of uh, a sort of empathy for what seems to, what appears to be stupidity, <laughs> right? Um, and and so it's uh, it's a practice I've, for me, uh, and, and because I'm I, I have a tendency to get angry at at people who just don't seem to get it. <laughs> We've covered an awful lot of ground from uh, from Buddhism to climate change to PR to uh, fake news. Uh, I want to do two things. One, I'm, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, D- DSmog blog? Yeah. Uh, where to come from? What was the thought behind it? Yeah. Um, it, it was kind of an accident. We, uh, we were just redoing my website at Hogan and Associates and somebody said we should have a community relations section. Like we're doing something for the community. And so we thought, well, it should be about communications. And there's all this confusion about, um, uh, Climate change, why don't we have a site that helps people sort through the, you know, the problems of climate change and the real science and get to the bottom of it. And so it seemed like a good idea until I started reading all these files. And I, I started looking at it, I thought like, oh my God, this is like horrendous. These tobacco, ex-tobacco apologists are now working on climate change. And I started to, I started to realize that this whole idea that there was that there this narrative that there was a debate among scientists about whether or not humans are actually having an effect on the climate and and causing climate change and whether or not it was serious and so on this was before inconvenient truth okay and uh, but i realized that it was a fake debate and that it was basically driven by public relations people and we started to look at it and i started to read more about it and i started to get unbelievably angry about it and so i was weirdly this shows you how much i knew about climate change I'm on a plane with my buddy flying to Tucson to uh, meet the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and I have this book and I'm reading about these uh, climate change misinformation, these fake scientists. And I just was furious. And so I handed it to my buddy who's, we went, you know, we were lawyers t- together at one time. And uh, he reads it and he said, what should we do about this? And I said, well, I was just reading in Fortune magazine the other day that there's this thing called citizen journalism. What? And they were talking about this, these things called blogs. I mean, I don't really know what a blog is, but why don't we start a blog and we can start writing about this, get, you know, getting information out. And that's basically how it started. He put the money into it and we hired a bunch of reporters, started doing the research. And what we found out was that it was way worse and much bigger a problem than we had originally thought. There are groups all over, very well-funded groups who are in the business of ad hominem attacks on scientists and and efforts to try and undermine science. So how do we deal with it? How do we not go fishing or swimming and just check out? How do we how do we find our way? Well, you know, it's interesting because I asked the Dalai Lama <laughs> yeah. a question very similar to that. Okay. And he said, in Tibet, we have a saying um, that if you fail once, you try again. Fail twice, try again. Nine times fail nine times try again because if you stop that's giving up and you you can't give up you just have to keep and he said i've been talking to the world about the power of compassion for 49 years and i just now feel like people are starting to listen and so good point it, it just seems to me that you don't 
you don't want that's i think i think in a way that's what Thich Nhat Han was yeah, saying you got to yeah. deal with the despair same, right same thing. we can't we have to realize you know we have to be more emotionally aware 